Hey, good morning, and thank you for joining us at Experience Church, Church Online. My name is Austin. I'm one of the pastors here on the team, and I want to thank you for jumping in this Sunday morning. Today, we're going to continue our talks in Romans 8, covering verses 31 through 32. If you missed last week, Pastor Mark and I did a podcast-ish discussion-style message through verses 28 through 30. And today, we'll start the end of chapter 8 with a couple of questions from Paul. And so let's read it today. Paul says in verse 31, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Today I want to talk about what these things are. And then I want to talk about the implications of these things in our lives. But before we do that, let's pray. Let's pray that God would reveal his word to us in a way that makes sense and causes us to seek after him even more. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you today for your word that's living, that is alive, that is active, that moves, and that shapes our hearts to be positioned towards you. We pray today that you would speak to us. God, that you would open our eyes and our ears to see and to hear what it is that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul kicks us off with this question. What then shall we say to these things? Now, here's the issue with this text. We don't actually know what these things are. These things could be verses 28 through 30. These things could be the entirety of Romans chapter 8. And because this is one letter to the church of Rome, these things could mean everything back to chapter 1. And so what I thought we would do is take a journey through Romans and talk about some of the highlights and the outlines that Paul gives us in reference to the gospel and our lives as believers. See, in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says that we're justified by faith, that Christ died for the ungodly, that we're reconciled to God through Christ's death, that we're buried and raised with Christ, that sin is no longer our master, that we have eternal life in Jesus, that we're delivered from the law and sin, Chapter 8, that there's no condemnation for those in Christ, that those in Christ live in the Spirit, that we've been adopted into the family of God, and now we're heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ, that there's a glory to be revealed to us, that we have the first fruits of the Spirit, and that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We learned in chapter 8, verse 26, that the Spirit intercedes for us, that God is working for the good in our lives, that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of God, that we've been called, we've been justified, and that we will be glorified. So now let's ask that question again. Based on these things, what do we say? And I want to offer some ideas to you. Maybe our response to these things is worship. Psalm 29 says, ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Maybe it's meditation. Psalm 145 says, I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Or maybe it's thanksgiving and praise because verses six through seven say that we'll speak of the might of your awesome acts and declare your greatness. That we'll utter the memory of your goodness and sing of your righteousness. Or maybe the response is to testify. Like in John four, when Jesus met the woman at the well and after he ministered to her, She went back into town and said, come meet the man who told me all that I'd ever done. Or maybe you're like me, and after reading and reviewing everything in chapter 5 through 8, the appropriate response feels like surrender, where we come before our king and we lay our lives down and we say, yet not as I will, but as you will. But what if these actions and responses aren't actual things that we feel inspired to do. Like, what if you're watching this online right now and you can hear everything that the Bible says and you feel indifferent? Like, there's not an action or response that you feel after reading these things. I remember when I first started going to church uh, at 17 years old, Twin Lakes Baptist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. I walked in and man, (laughs) I look differently than everyone else. Uh, I talked a little different than everyone else. My background was completely different than everyone else. I remember walking in with what I would call like the early 2000s hip hop starter kit. You know, the tall tees, the backwards jerseys, 
the crooked baseball caps, the Air Force Ones, the khakis with the cuff and a crease. Like, this is how I walked into this church. But honestly, none of that mattered to me. Like, it didn't bother me that we dressed and, you know, came from different areas. That didn't bother me at all. What bothered me was that our response was different. Like, why, when the guy up there with the suit reads something from the Bible, why does everyone say amen? Like, I don't feel an amen stirring up inside of me. Like, why, when they're singing these songs, why does everyone even sing to this poorly tuned piano from this red songbook? And I would wonder, as I would be in that church, like, was there something wrong with me? Because I didn't feel the same kind of response that they did? It was almost to the point where I would wonder, like, does my indifference mean I have a faith deficiency or that I'm not as holy as these other people? Does it mean I'm not a Christian? And I'll, I say that to invite you today. Maybe you're watching this and you've been watching for a while, or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time and you get to this place and you say, hey, Austin, I hear what you're saying. I hear what Paul is talking about, but I don't feel the same response. I just, I just don't, and I think that's okay. See, faith is a journey. It's a journey where we allow God to take us on this adventure roller coaster of life, and we become more aware of God's presence and His goodness. And at some points, you're going to wonder, and you're going to question. But I want to say to you what Paul says to the church in Philippi. When he says, I'm sure of this, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Listen, if you're watching this and you're wondering and you're questioning, it's okay. Keep asking, keep seeking, but do it in the context of the church. Lean on your brothers and your sisters in Christ through Pray the Bay, which is our prayer meeting we do every day, through small discussion and community groups, or through our Bible in one year meeting that we do every morning. We do a short call where we jump in on the Bible app and we discuss what the reading is for that day. And so it's okay to question. It's okay to wonder, but do it in the context of your church family. And I wanna pray for you before we even move forward and pray for anyone who's kind of in that place. God, we ask today that you would give us this stirring inside to seek after you, to chase after these questions that we have and these feelings that we have. And we pray that you would reveal yourself as we do so. In Jesus' name, amen. And so Paul goes from this place of what should our response be to this rhetorical question? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, if you remember earlier in Romans 8, we talked about the indwelling spirit of God and how the word if could be interchanged with the word because. So let's ask that question one more time with the word because. Because God is for us, who can be against us? Now see, that question shifts a little bit inside of me because it tells me that it doesn't mean that there's not gonna be anything against me. Right, this verse doesn't negate the fact that in this life we'll face trouble and opposition. It doesn't mean a trouble-free life. See, Jesus even says in John 16, I've said these things to you that you may have peace because in this world, you're gonna face trouble, trouble. But take heart because I've overcome the world. What I think Paul is saying in this rhetorical question is that if we take everything in our lives, the needs, the trouble, the opposition, the hurt, the sadness, the sorrow, the tears, if we take it all and stack it up against the glory of God that awaits us, it doesn't compare. See, this question that Paul poses to us isn't a mathematical equation. It's us looking through the lens of the gospel and letting that be our filter. It reminds me of this psalm that I memorized when I first started going to church, Psalm 73. The psalmist starts complaining. He starts whining to God, like, why do these, these wicked people get all the good stuff? Why don't bad things happen to bad people? Why do good things happen to bad people? I don't get it, God. But he gets to this place in Psalm 73, verses 16 
and 17, when he says, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, until I went to church, until I was around other believers. See, the questioning and the wondering is okay, as long as we do it in the context of our brothers and sisters in Christ. What Paul is saying is, in light of eternity, nothing compares to the glory and the hope that we have in heaven. This question that Paul asks, if God is for us, who can be against us, is rooted in the same understanding that David had of God when he approached Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, David says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? See, both Paul and David make these statements based on their understanding of the entirety, the nature of who God is. Paul uses this juxtaposition of for us and against us to drive home the point of God's favor for his sons and his daughters. See, in chapters 1 through 3, if you were to just read that, you, would, you could conclude that God might not be for us because all it talks about is unrighteousness, judgment, and law. But after that, going to verse chapter 8, Paul clearly outlines that God truly is for us. See, here's the misunderstanding. That phrase, for us, doesn't mean that God does whatever we want him to do. It doesn't mean that he grants every little desire of our heart like genie Jesus that Pastor Mark told, talked about last week. When Paul says that God is for us, here's what he means. God is doing everything he can in order for our hearts to be shaped and transformed in order for us to become more like Jesus, because Jesus is the goal. God wants us to become the best version of ourselves. Now you've heard it before, you've seen it online and on social media, I'm trying to become the best version of me, just become the best version of you, and if we all become the best version of ourselves, we'll change the world. Well, guess what? The best version of you isn't found in a self-help book or it's not found in like a Bikram yoga class or a personality assessment. The best version of you isn't found in more degrees and a higher salary. It's not found in more philanthropy and going green. The best version of ourselves is not found in being biodegradable straws and intermittent fasting. <laughs> like the best version of you is that which is found in Jesus. And this is what Paul is trying to tell the church. For us to become the best version of ourselves is to become conformed to the image of Jesus. When Paul says that God is for us, what he's saying is, Paul, or what he's saying is that God is for our good. And we know, it, like in last week's message, our good is to become just like Jesus. And then Paul ends this text that we're reading at least with verse 32 with another rhetorical question. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And so I went to Facebook this last week to ask you guys what the best gift is you've ever received. And here's what you said. Someone said the best gift they ever received was me. <laughs> Other people said it was their kids, both biological and adopted. Some people said the best gift they ever received was their pet, while others said that it was AirPods or painting of a family. Someone even said the best gift they ever received was the Sega Dreamcast, which is like the worst gaming system that ever came out, maybe second worst. Some people said it was Kinex, you know, those Lego-like toys while someone else said the best gift that they ever received was the original Nintendo. That's right, Duck Hunt, all day. And lastly, someone said the best gift they ever received was a Daisy BB gun. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. <laughs> Come on, you remember that movie. See, this is how much God loves us and this is how much God is for us. As a parent, I know. I never want to get my kids like the best gift when they're young 
Because what it does is it sets an expectation that next year, the next gift I get them has to be even bigger. Like, if I were to buy my kids the best gift right now, it sets up these expectations that future gifts have to progressively be more expensive, bigger, and better. They have to ramp up as the years go on. But God does something so unique, something that no other parent would do, no other father would do. God gives us the best gift, the best gift gift he could ever give us before we even deserved it. He gave us Jesus, the gift, the gift of all gifts, our Savior, our Lord, and our King. God gives us the best gift. And so if God gives us the best gift, Jesus, why wouldn't he give us insert need here? Why wouldn't he give us health? Or why wouldn't he give us peace? Or why wouldn't he give us hope? Why wouldn't he give us these things if he's given us the best gift ever? Let me say it another way. Because God already gave us the most significant gift he could ever give, what would he not give us? And I would want to finish with this thought. Because in my life, if God doesn't give me anything else, it will already have been enough because he's given me Jesus. He's given me hope for reconciliation to the Father. He's given me forgiveness of sin. He's given me a peace that surpasses my understanding. He's given me vision for my future and a hope to know that later in life I will be received unto glory. He's given me purpose to live out. He's given me meaning to the pain that I've been through in my life. If God doesn't give me anything else, he's already given me enough through his son, Jesus. And so today as we close, I want to pray with you. Maybe you haven't received this gift of Jesus and you'd like to. Maybe you've heard all of the things that Paul outlines in Romans 8 or the entirety of Romans of all of the blessings and the promises that God gives us and you wanna be a part of that. You wanna receive that today. I welcome you to follow me in this prayer and say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I turn from my sin I turn from my ways and I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.